My name is Mark Ellis, uh, Executive Director of the International Bar Association. And I, I just want to give you a, just a few minutes on kind of the, the, the journey that we took to get where we are uh, today with this uh, new task force. And it, it really started uh, back at, uh, in September 11th, 2001. Justice Goldstone and I were in London at that time, uh, actually uh, uh, meeting for lunch. Uh, we left uh, uh, lunch and started walking back to the uh, IBA offices in London. Uh, and as we were walking back, uh, looking at the expressions on people's faces, uh, we knew something was amiss. And when we entered the IBA offices, uh, the entire staff uh, were sitting around uh, a television uh, uh, watching in silence. Uh, the events unfolding. Um, and of course, recognizing uh, based on what the world was witnessing that we were entering into uh, a period we had simply not seen before. And I remember turning to Justice Goldstone uh, and without saying a word, uh, we both knew that uh, we were facing something that uh, was quite extraordinary um, and something that I think made us feel um, a need to respond in some way. Uh, and as governments and non-government organizations move forward uh, to take this journey, uh, uh, recognizing that we were facing these complex issues uh, in combating this new form of terrorism, uh, the International Bar Association uh, as well decided in October uh, of 2001 at its annual meeting uh, where the leadership of the IBA um, agreed to the request to create uh, a terrorism task force, um, a task force to look at uh, the international uh, issues and, and components in combating uh, international terrorism. And so the International Bar Association set that, um, uh, set that first task force up in uh, 2001. Justice Richard Goldstone was the chair, co-chair of that task force along with Ambassador uh, Emilio Cardenas, and at that uh, moment uh, we created a task force that worked for over a year in uh, looking at uh, uh, the, again, the issues uh, in regards to international law and how to uh, deal with issues relevant to accountability, uh, uh, relevant to the prevention of, of, of these terrorist acts. But even then, what was key for us uh, and it was important for the entire association at that time, was in looking at what our core journey would be, it would be how do we, uh, how do we combat this scourge of terrorism, but at the same time protect uh, these fundamental rights, uh, uh, human rights and civil liberties. And that's where uh, the first task force um, uh, and its report focused on. And it was a, it was a, a very successful a publication and, and in great demand. But of course, since 2003, uh, we have still witnessed uh, uh, issues such as Guantanamo uh, still perhaps being the most striking symbol of, of a flagrant violation of international law, and yet even today uh, not being able to have any certainty of when, uh, uh, when uh, there would be a, a, a deadline closure date on that. Uh, obviously, we then faced terrorist acts in in uh, London, in Madrid, in Mumbai, and other cities that acts, uh, terrorist acts were foiled, but yet all of these acts are geared towards uh, civilians. And so uh, this started the IBA uh, thinking yet again it was time to uh, create uh, a new task force uh, to bring up to date this analysis of, of international law, kind of a fresh and updated assessment of where we needed to be. Uh, and so two years ago, once again, the International Bar Association and its leadership uh, with support of the IBA Foundation uh, created uh, this uh, new task force uh, uh, chaired again uh, by uh, Justice, uh, Justice Goldstone. Um, and so this is an opportunity for us uh, to launch uh, this important uh, report. Uh, and so again, we're thankful for all of you being here uh, today. Before I turn it over to the task force, I want to uh, mention a couple things. One, uh, to acknowledge uh, 
uh, Alex Wilkes, uh, who's over here, is a senior uh, IBA attorney in the London office. He, he, he's a remarkable uh, young man uh, who has really been the person that has steered this uh, report for the last two and a half years, and he, 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 uh, he should get a great deal of credit in, in helping us stay on track and get this report uh, uh, created. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Bates, who's not here and who was the uh, primary author of the report and, and how we approached this with as, as Elizabeth setting out uh, the various uh, pr uh, chapters of this report and then working in a collaborative way with the task force in assessing, uh, uh, revising um, uh, the, 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 the report and in the end uh, that's, that's the approach we, we took and I think that was a very successful approach and I'm very grateful to Elizabeth and uh, unfortunately she's again not able to be here but she certainly uh, earns a lot of credit for the work she's put in on this. Uh, and finally, to the Open Society Institute, it's, um, it, it, the OSI has played such a, an important role in this, in, in this area of international law, as we all know, but it's particularly important for the International Bar Association to be able to do this in cooperation and partnership with OSI because OSI has played such an important role for us uh, uh, over the years and has been a, a strong supporter of what the International Bar Association has been doing. In, in, uh, in the field of international justice. And so I'm very appreciative to OSI uh, for, for hosting this. Um, I have been asked before I turn it over uh, to give you uh, one lawyerly phrase here that I'm supposed to read. I'm just going to read what they've given me. Quote, please note that this event will be recorded. By participating in the event, you are giving your permission for your comments to be included wherever the event's audio recording is featured, such as source, or OSI podcast in the IBA website. So you are now warned uh, <laughs> on this. And I want to encourage what's going to happen here is even those that are listening on the webcast are going to be able to send in questions uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the panelists. So we're, we're eager to have all of those who have signed up to listen to this wide, uh, live webcast to be able to do that. And we, we're looking forward to, uh, to engaging them through this, uh, through this question uh, and answer period. So uh, I, am, I am now going to turn this over to our task force. You're going to say a few things on, on OSI. And I, again, want to appreciate uh, or thank all of you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Welcome, everyone. I'm Amrit Singh. I'm Senior Legal Officer for National Security and Counterterrorism here at the Open Society Justice Initiative. This program litigates and conducts advocacy on human rights uh, abuses conducted in the national security context. Uh, we are delighted to be able to co-host this launch of this very important report. Um, I think uh, uh, the IBA's engagement in the, the counterterrorism and international law issues and the report in particular are, are uh, especially important because I think there is no other issue that uh, is as dangerous to the checks and balances that are emblematic of constitutional democracies as the issue of counterterrorism and national security. Um, what we have seen uh, well before 9-11 and even after 9-11 is a growing trend of countries that um, in increasingly uh, invoke exceptionalism when it comes to uh, adhering to the rule of law in the context of uh, national security and counterterrorism policies. Discrimination against minorities, Muslims, South Asians, and other minorities is, is rampant uh, in many countries. Arbitrary detention, administrative detention without, without charge or trial, torture and forced disappearances, and I will not, I will not continue to, uh, the, the report goes into an enormous amount of detail about the list of uh, kinds of human rights abuses that we are witnessing. Um, I think that this, this report is, is therefore of, of particular importance because uh, this issue threatens to cause lasting damage to, to, the, to, to the very nature of the checks and balances inherent in constitutional democracies and also because uh, I think that uh, it, it, uh, uh, it, it threatens the um, adherence to international law. So I, I, you know, if, to the extent that the panel seems, thinks it's uh, appropriate, I think it would be nice to hear what, uh, what the views are on um, uh, a report like this uh, in a context like this. What, what, are, what do we expect um, 
uh, countries to do in 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 this in 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 this climate of exceptionalism in terms of their obligations under international law. Um, just a quick uh, quick comment on uh, the partnership between the IBA and the Open Society Justice Initiative. Um, uh, we've had the opportunity to work closely with with Alex and um, in the context and the IBA in the context of a particular uh, um, uh, uh, human rights defender in uh, Kenya uh, who has recently become uh, the target of uh, uh, arbitrary detention by the Ugandan government. Um, and in, uh, his name is Alamin Kimathi. And the case, uh, Alamin is, is a tireless human rights defender, Kenyan human rights defender, who has for many years worked on national security related human rights abuses in Kenya. And when he went to Uganda uh, to monitor trial proceedings for uh, six uh, uh, Kenyan nationals who were rendered without due process from Kenya to Uganda, Mr. Kimathi was detained along with another lawyer, Mbugwa Murethi, also a Kenyan national a Supreme Court advocate in Kenya. Um, and as it happens, and what we see in our work is, it's, I think the IBA's work is particularly important because lawyers and human rights defenders today who are working on national security issues are themselves coming under an enormous amount of threat. Uh, Alamin is now detained. He has now been detained for six months on trumped up terrorism related charges in Uganda. Uh, when um, Mbugwa Murethi, the lawyer, was also detained with him but subsequently released. And then, subsequently, my colleague Clara Guttridge and I went to Uganda to mon monitor the uh, bail hearing proceedings for Alamin. We got detained at the Uganda airport for more than 17 hours. So it, what we're seeing increasingly is, is a trend towards uh, criminalization, towards harassment of, in, of people who are trying to, in, in fact, just do the right thing, just to trying to monitor uh, the rule of law, which I, which I understand to be very fundamental to what the IBA does. And then finally, I don't want to spend too much time on, uh, in between the audience and the panel, but I'd like to just uh, talk a little bit about what the Justice Initiative in particular is doing uh, on the issue of, na of uh, uh, addressing human rights abuses in the national security context. Well, um, we had a victory that we, we actually can't take credit for uh, uh, just last week. Uh, a client of ours, Mohammed al Sharkawi, uh, was detained in Egypt for uh, 15 years without trial or charge, administratively detained, and owing to the regime change, he was just released. Um, we had filed a case on his behalf before the African Commission challenging his prolonged detention without trial or charge. Um, and uh, so certainly this is, this, is, this is good news. In East Africa, we're monitoring the uh, uh, a, a broad range of national security related abuses in, uh, in Uganda, Kenya, and, and other countries. And then finally, uh, in the, we are working uh, together with our Freedom of Information program to uh, bring accountability for um, uh, extraordinary rendition policies. In particular, we are uh, engaged in European court litigation uh, in the El Masri case that, is, that the Freedom of Information program has taken the lead on. This is a case that, um, just to quickly sum up the facts as a man, who was uh, detained in, uh, at the, at the Macedonian-Serbian border by uh, Macedonian forces acting in complicity with the United States in the, in the context of the extraordinary rendition program that was driven by the CIA. He was detained in and, and abused in Macedonian custody and then handed over to the CIA and detained for five months in a CIA detention facility in Afghanistan. And then ultimately, he was dumped on, on the roadside in Albania without any kind of apology or explanation as to what, uh, why he was treated in this horrific manner. He, Mr. El Masri's attempts to obtain justice in the United States courts have not met with any success. Uh, his cases were dismissed. His case was dismissed by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals on grounds of the state secrets privilege, and the Supreme Court of the United States denied cert uh, in 2007. Um, uh, the, the case before the European Court brought by the Justice Initiative challenges Macedonia's complicity in the extraordinary rendition program and uh, seeks remedies against the government of Macedonia. And I'd just like to say three things about why this case is particularly significant. First of all, 
the claims raised against Macedonia include uh, claims under Article 3 of the European Convention, which uh, prohibits the transfer of individuals to uh, countries where they are at risk of torture. And so the, the factual, the, as a matter of fact, that the European Court application is against the government of Macedonia, but the Article 3 claim is inextricably linked with the uh, abuses in, that Mr. El-Masri endured because of the United States' role in this case. And so while the United States may have escaped every measure of accountability in its own country, there still stand other jurisdictions. There still are courts that may be open to at least indirectly address accountability. If not uh, for the United States directly, then through uh, holding Macedonia accountable. And the second reason why this case is important is that the, 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 is the, is that the European Court has communicated the case to Macedonia with a list of questions about specifically addressed to Macedonia saying, Macedonia, did you, did you engage in the following acts with respect to El, Mr. El Masri? And this is significant from a jurisprudential point of view because the case in the United States did not even make it to a stage where the United States government was required to respond on the merits uh, to, the, uh, to the complaint. So here is uh, a European court, it's, it's a preliminary stage, but nonetheless, it has, an it has advanced to a stage already uh, beyond what US courts have permitted. And then finally, thus far, the state secrets privilege has not been invoked in this case in contrast to uh, US court proceedings. And then finally, I'd like to mention one more case that the Justice Initiative is engaged in. It's the case of uh, Abdel Rahim Al Nashri, who is a Saudi national of Yemeni descent, who has been held now in CIA custody since 2002, almost a decade. He is currently detained in Guantanamo, and the Justice Initiative has brought litigation against the government of Poland for hosting Mr. Al Nashri's. Uh, uh, a torture and detention essentially on a CIA black site. Again, uh, we hope that this will bring some measure of accountability against the government of Poland um, and also indirectly against the government of the United States. And with that, I turn it over to the panel. Well, thank you very much, Amrit, and thank you also for me and the panel for, for uh, hosting this evening's event. Mark Ellis mentioned the first report that the International Bar Association brought out in 2003. That, that report presciently suggested that the events of 9-11 of 2001 had set governments, international lawmakers and non-governmental organizations on a long journey to tackle the many complex legal problems inherent in responding to what was a new form and what is a new form of, ter of terrorism. At the core of the journey lay the task of combating terrorism without jeopardizing the protection of basic rights and freedoms. Since the publication of that report eight years ago, further large-scale attacks have taken, Mark Ellis mentioned, in major cities around the world, and what is important, several other attempts have been foiled. The rhetoric of the Bush administration's war on terror has stood in sharp contrast to the belief of many that terrorist threats are the proper purview of policing and the criminal law and criminal justice rather than military intervention and the law of war and the talk of war. Some nevertheless have questioned even whether contemporary international law is equipped to meet the challenges of modern terrorism. Complex le legal questions have confronted governments and lawmakers alike. Many questions have been asked. Do states' human rights obligations apply extraterritorially? Does the use of force and counter-terrorism constitute armed conflict with the consequence that international humanitarian law should apply? If so, what is its relationship to international human rights law? To what extent are states obliged to provide remedies for victims of terrorist attacks? and victims of violations which occur in the course of counter-terrorism operations. So the, in, in light of these questions, the dilemma that faced the, the International Bar Association was really whether to update the 2003 report or start a new one. 
to set up a new task force and, and, and rather than update what had become very quickly a dated report uh, with, with a new one. And, and the decision was taken, I think correctly, that there should be a, not a second edition, but a new book, uh, a new consideration, a fresh consideration of these and many other challenging issues. In response, the IBA convened a new task force and as Mark has also mentioned, it was able to do so thanks to the generous support from the foundation of the International Bar Association. The objective of the new task force was to provide expert analysis of relevant international law and the consideration of the manner in which it continues to regulate states' counter-terrorism policies and to provide a truly global overview of the considerable developments in state practice including, but not restricted at all, to the United States-led war on terror. What was the methodology we, we adopted? It was important for the IBA, as the, really the international voice of the legal profession, to attract a wide range of expertise to the task force in order to reflect the global and multidisciplinary nature of the challenges. Uh, I, I happily accepted the invitation from Mark Ellis to, to, to lead this second task force. I'm pleased to say that, there, that we have three other members of the task force with us this evening and who will shortly speak to us. L let me introduce them in the order in which they will, will speak. Professor Juan Mendez is the co-chair of the IBA's Human Rights Institute and currently the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture. He was formerly the president of the International Center for Transitional Justice, the ICTJ, and the, Inter and, uh, and the Inter American Commission for Human Rights. His scholarship in the field of international law and knowledge of, Ameri of the Americas proved indispensable. Julia Hall is Amnesty International's senior counsel on counterterrorism in Europe. Julia brought with her a wealth of experience from the field important practical experience and added a valuable practitioner's viewpoint to the task force apart from her, from her really in-depth and impressive knowledge of international law. Professor Javed Rechman is the head of Brunel Law School in London. He's an expert in Islamic law, international human rights law and international terrorism, in particular relating to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Professor Rachman brought with him a critical insight into the challenges affecting this troubled region. Two other members of the task force are not with us this evening. They, they, they are Professor Judge Eugene Cotron, Chairman of the Centre of Middle Eastern and Islamic, School, uh, and Islamic Law at the School of African and Oriental Studies, SOAS, in London, and Mr. Geis de Fris, who between 2004 and 2007 was the, Europeans uni was the European Union's counterterrorism co coordinator. The author of the book is Elizabeth Stubbins Bates, who unfortunately also cannot be with us this evening. She was at the time the David Davies Research Fellow and and, uh, at, at the London School of Economics and is currently a visiting fellow at the London School. She, she was commissioned by the IBA to write the report. With its intention of providing expert analysis of such a broad range of legal issues and global coverage of examples of state practice, the report was ambitious in its scope. Elizabeth demonstrated her understanding of the key debates in counterterrorism in formulating the structure of the report and consistently producing draft chapters to the task force that really have been of exceptional quality. Mark has mentioned Alex Wilkes, who, who really managed with tremendous skill the whole operation. He, he spent a tremendous amount of time and gave devotion to, to, to this task, and I know he has the deep gratitude of each of the members of the task force. I speak on behalf of the whole task force in saying what a privilege it has been to work with you, Alex. Thank you very much. The task force had two plenary meetings in London. We exchanged many and long, long, long emails during the course of the proceedings. The task force oversaw and supported the drafting process of Elizabeth Stubbins-Bates and offered its guidance on research uh, 
and on latest developments. The task force held its second and final plenary meeting in May 2010, towards the end of the drafting process, approving the final chapters of the report and its conclusions and recommendations. We took a multilateral approach, striving to present the range of opinion of its members, whilst remaining, we hope, scholarly and rigorous. The report analyzes the key current issues in counter-terrorism, including the extraterritorial application of international human rights law, the interoperability of international human rights law, and international humanitarian law, reform in counter-terrorism, and victims' rights to a remedy and reparations. We also hope that significant value lies in its updated analysis of the case law and examples of state practice drawn from a truly global selection of jurisdictions ranging from Colombia to the Philippines. The report aims to contribute and add value to the current debates surrounding counter-terrorism and international law through providing authoritative, con uh, authoritative conclusions and recommendations for states, for intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations and institutions, the judiciary and policy makers to, to, to consider how to strike the balance, very difficult balance to strike, between ensuring respect for fundamental rights on the one hand, whilst protecting all people from terrorist violence on the other. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to call on Juan Mendez. Thank you. First, I, I want to thank uh, uh, Mark and the International Bar Association generally for giving me the opportunity to participate in this task force and the privilege of working with my fellow task force uh, members and particularly for working uh, with Alex, but uh, under the chairmanship of uh, Justice Goldstone. It's, uh, it has been quite an interesting uh, uh, task for me to participate in. And um, I, uh, it, it was a challenge to follow on, a, on an excellent report that had been uh, published by the IBA earlier on. Uh, but I also think this report should be seen in the context of a growing literature uh, of uh, uh, analyses of how uh, uh, the, the, the pol policies uh, to counter terrorism uh, should uh, be uh, conducted uh, uh, with uh, uh, full respect for international law obligations of every state. Um, I had the privilege also of working early on in uh, the 2002 report by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is one of the reports uh, uh, well uh, worth mentioning. Uh, but I also want to mention the recent uh, International Commission of Jurists report uh, done by a panel of eminent jurists uh, chaired by Justice uh, Arthur Chaskelson of South Africa, which is also an, an enormous contribution. And I want to mention a report uh, written by Helen Duffy for uh, Interrights uh, in, in London. Um, I think uh, our report, uh, nevertheless, contributes something uh, with a special emphasis on, 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 a couple, uh, on two or three uh, important matters, and in that sense, complements all these other important reports uh, 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 in a significant way. Um, I, I think as the, the publication itself uh, uh, signifies as a subtitle, uh, the report concentrates on issues of accountability, meaning the obligation of states to provide accountability for uh, violations that may uh, have happened in the context of counterterrorism, uh, of uh, remedies, meaning that the states have obligations to provide victims of those violations, uh, remedies that are <coughs> contemplated in international law, and uh, also concentrates on reform uh, in the sense that uh, uh, in, the, in the almost 10 years in which the war on terror has been going on, there's been many occasions to rectify uh, the uh, wrong paths that have been taken, and uh, there's always an agenda for reform, and this report tries to contribute, contribute to it. Um, I think the, the reason to insist that uh, the war on terror uh, has the limits of international law is perhaps self-evident uh, to all of us. And it's not only uh, 
a legal uh, and a moral question, but it's also a condition of effectiveness. Uh, many, many people say, you know, that if we really want to defeat uh, terrorists, uh, the best thing that we can do is to uh, uh, stick to the moral high ground, and that means respecting uh, every state's obligations under international law. Um, because the opposite uh, is uh, just an occasion to uh, breed uh, more insatisfaction and, and, uh, and contempt and, and uh, creates uh, the training ground basically for uh, new generations of, uh, of uh, recruits to, to terrorist organizations to fight against uh, uh, democratic states. Um, but obviously our, our main argument is not a practical one. Our main argument is legal. And I think uh, another important argument, of course, is moral. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, I'm glad that Amrit has uh, mentioned exceptionalism, because uh, the whole tendency after 2001 was to uh, pretend that the that terrorism was such a new phenomenon. And of course, it was different in significant ways after September 11 of 2001. But it was such a new phenomenon that it allowed uh, states to write in a clean slate, as it were. Uh, this report uh, obviously takes the opposite view, uh, that if, no matter how novel the situation created after 9-11, there wasn't a clean slate. There was a set of obligations, uh, uh, legal and moral, that, uh, were, that had to be um, uh, uh, respected by states, no matter what uh, type of uh, choices they made in pursuing terrorist organizations. And that, uh, I think, precisely this sense that you could rewrite the laws of war and rewrite uh, the, uh, the laws of human rights because uh, this was an excep exceptional situation uh, brings up the ugliest face of exceptionalism. Uh, and I have to say that in the United States, a lot of people uh, talk about exceptionalism in a positive way. Uh, but outside of the United States, it sounds exactly the opposite. And quite frankly, every dictatorship that I have been, uh, had the, not the privilege, but the obligation to be engaged with in my human rights work have always invoked some kind of exception, some kind of state of exception, some kind of uh, necessity that is not contemplated by international law. So in that sense, uh, I think it's important to, to point out what the legal uh, framework is, uh, and also to signify that the legal framework does not uh, unduly tie the hands uh, of people who, in good faith, want to, uh, to fight against uh, terrorism. Um, nevertheless, uh, uh, it's important to, uh, to, to, to point out uh, that states that do have uh, a choice to uh, uh, attack or counterattack terrorism uh, as a law enforcement uh, option or as, a, as, a, as an armed conflict option. But those uh, choices are not wide open. I mean, uh, they, they, they are limited by the, uh, by the conditions in which either law enforcement <laughs> or uh, armed conflict uh, has to be carried out. Uh, in that sense, uh, the, uh, the matter of uh, defining uh, the war on terror in such a broad way as to not having any kind of limitations in, in geography or in time uh, obviously is a bad faith uh, application of international humanitarian law because uh, it, it, it extends uh, rights and and abilities that states have under international humanitarian law to situations that were not contemplated by the Geneva Conventions or by the whole body of international uh, humanitarian law. And so uh, uh, the rhetoric uh, of calling something the war on terror, like the war on poverty, cannot be extended to apply uh, uh, without limits to uh, a war that doesn't have uh, a geographical limit or uh, a temporal limit. Uh, and cannot uh, allow uh, use of force, uh, use of deadly force, to be applied in situations that are completely extraneous to armed conflict uh, per se. Uh, in the area of accountability, um, 
I have to say uh, that uh, two years ago we were very encouraged by some of the early steps of the Obama administration. Uh, and I'm, I'm still encouraged by some of them, uh, but discouraged by some other ones. And I think, first of all, the prohibition of torture, uh, uh, the uh, reinstatement of the Uniform Code of Military Justice under no uncertain terms is one of those uh, positive things. The prohibition on the use of black sites and the prohibition on extraordinary renditions are also obviously uh, steps in the right direction that were taken two years ago. I obviously want to be uh, sensitive to the possibility that even black sites and, uh, and extraordinary renditions may still be happening because they were mired in secrecy when they were happening before 2009. So it's impossible to say that, that they're not happening now again. Uh, but be that as it may, the official uh, <coughs> sanction against them and uh, keeping our fingers crossed, the lack of new evidence that, it's, that, 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 that they're still being used uh, is uh, one of those steps in the right direction that I, uh, that I think uh, bears mentioning. Um, I also think that the uh, decision by the administration not to challenge the use of the exclusionary rule in the Gailani case and to allow the case to go forward by excluding evidence uh, that had been led to via the torture of Mr. Gailani is uh, also an encouraging uh, step. Um, but uh, on the other hand, um, uh, I think we, we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot uh, say uh, that everything is the way it should be because uh, when it comes to torture particularly, the state has an obligation to investigate, prosecute, and punish every act of torture. And not only that has not happened, uh, the administration has been actively uh, preventing it from happening. Uh, and uh, I think, in fact, uh, uh, the, the, uh, in the area of accountability uh, um, is uh, uh, where you know, some uh, encouraging first steps like uh, congressional inquiries uh, like the Senate uh, Armed Forces report, uh, Committee on Armed Forces uh, report uh, chaired by Senator Levin that went, uh, that, that encouraged us to believe that some of these things could be investigated to the full extent of uh, where the facts led us, uh, unfortunately have not been followed through. And uh, for example, we still don't know uh, uh, what the result is of the inquiry co conducted by the Senate Committee on, uh, on Intelligence that uh, supposedly was the counterpart of that, of the Levin report. Uh, uh, also, the special uh, um, prosecutor uh, named by uh, Attorney General Holder uh, has not produced a significant uh, uh, report or uh, prosecutorial action, uh, although he was charged precisely with looking at uh, what the results of the torture memos had been in, in terms of actual practice of torture. Um, in terms of reform, I, uh, I think it's very discouraging to see the use of preventive detention, uh, especially uh, recently uh, the administration uh, applying it. Uh, let me make it clear that uh, in the context of, the, of international humanitarian law, detention uh, uh, until the end of hostilities is, of course, permissible. Um, but uh, I am afraid that the executive order uh, goes far beyond the limits of uh, uh, detention uh, in, uh, under the laws of war and, um, uh, and would allow pe pe people who have been arrested in a context completely separate from any kind of combat situation to be held in prolonged arbitrary detention without trial. Um, the same, I think, uh, can be said about the use of military commissions. Uh, the administration still uh, holds to the possibility of using civilian trials, and uh, we hope uh, that, uh, that that remains true, although the opposition in Congress is especially you know, putting lots of ex uh, obstacles to that. Um, but I would hope that the use of civilian trials would be uh, done to the exclusion of, of military uh, commissions and unfortunately that is not the case. Um, I'm also uh, hoping that the policy is still to close down Guantanamo, uh, but uh, it's taking much longer than we, than we all had hoped for, uh, for that uh, symbol of 
deviation from the high ground uh, by the United States uh, to, to be, to be, uh, to be over. Uh, targeted killings is also something that uh, we are uh, uh, very concerned about. Again, uh, targeted killings of combat, uh, of combatants is uh, perhaps not a violation of the laws of war. But we're still in this ambiguous uh, definition of what the war is that, allow, that would allow uh, targeted killing uh, of, uh, of people that have no relationship to combat situations. And that would uh, constitute extrajudicial execution uh, in no, uh, and no other uh, terms uh, to, uh, would apply to it. Um, I'm also concerned at the use of state secrets. Uh, and it's uh, the state secrets to prevent uh, t uh, torture victims from exercising their remedies is a clear violation of an international standard because under the torture convention, every state has an obligation to provide remedies for torture. And uh, putting obstacles on those remedies is contrary to international law. And this is having extraterritorial effect because in the Commission of Inquiry in England, for ex in the United Kingdom, uh, for example, there's a lot of talk about what they call the control principle. If the evidence is provided by another intelligence agency from another country, uh, they, are under, they have the control of whether the evidence can be revealed or not. Uh, and so the use of state secrets by the US government is having a negative effect uh, even in other parts of the world uh, as well. And I'm going to finish uh, 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 just basically uh, you know, uh, making the ob perhaps obvious point that the, the United States is uh, losing a lot of opportunities around the world uh, by not uh, uh, fighting this uh, war on terror uh, within the framework of international law and even of United States constitutional law. Um, uh, I just heard this afternoon, and uh, perhaps anecdotal evidence, but a human rights, uh, 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 someone quoted a human rights uh, leader from Egypt uh, saying that uh, they do want to talk to the United States about how to reorganize the, the, the new democratic Egyptian state, but that they uh, don't want to hear from the United States government, at least, until uh, the United States can uh, point out that it has cleaned up its act and is uh, now another, uh, again, a part of the community of nations that do respect human rights. Thank you. Thank you. Julia Hall? I'm not supposed to, I'm not sure how Julia, I'm, just turn am that I on. supposed to be? Yeah, you can turn that on. Okay. Just turn on I'm the, supposed to be the lounge singer there, okay, <laughs> with, the, with the mic, isn't no, I? That's good. Okay. Thank you, Juan. Okay, good. Um, I also want to thank OSI for hosting all of us today. We've had all of our meetings in London. It's wonderful to be here in New York. And I want to say what a pleasure it's been and a real privilege for me uh, to work with this really incredible group of distinguished jurists and academics. Um, I do want to talk about the book. I want to shift our focus a little, though. Uh, and, and talk about our commitment to including in this book a very serious and detailed section on victims' rights. Um, as you all know, the developments in terms of terrorism and counterterrorism in the last decade have been so numerous. And deciding how to take this 200 pages and use them to full effect was, a very, was, was difficult at times. I think that's fair enough to say. But I think the one thing that we had good consensus on was that we absolutely had to restate uh, what rights devolved upon victims. And there is a very detailed chapter in the book that deals with various types of victims. And so we do address the issue of victims of terrorist attacks. Uh, we do address the issue of victims of state-sponsored terrorism. But what I'm going to talk about is, is fairly narrow. And it really links up with, uh, with what Amrit uh, began talking about. I'm going to talk about victims of rendition and secret detention. Uh, <coughs> and I'd like to start the conversation by, by talking about the other labels that these victims have that have made it so difficult for Amrit and, and this entire group and many of you out there to advocate on their behalf. And that is because of the other labels that have been applied to them 
um, labels like terrorist, labels like national security threat, labels like Islamic militant. Um, these labels do not rest easily with the, their status as victims, right? Because if the discourse is that they are implicated in some way, they are in fact uh, terrorists or national security threats, um, we, we have had a hard time as advocates then also saying, but they're victims as well. And I think a byproduct of that difficulty has been that we have angled a lot in our advocacy. We've said, well, okay, you know, the governments have been very successful at casting uh, victims of human rights violations as terrorists and national security threats first. How, how can we get around that? How, how do we have legitimacy as human rights lawyers and activists um, when that discourse is so powerful and the governments are, are in league in, in that way? Um, in many instances then over the last eight years, instead of relying, for example, on the absolute legal prohibition and moral abhorrence of torture and enforced disappearance to advocate on behalf of victims, many, many of us, and I include myself in the group, we really resorted to more instrumental arguments, right? Uh, we've, we've kind of avoided the moral argument. We, we understood the United States government to say that it, hasn't, it actually hasn't been torturing, right? Even though we all knew it wasn't true. And so we couldn't, we couldn't actually find a real anchor to do our advocacy. And I think that a professor at the American University um, School of International Service really hit it, the nail on the head in a book that she wrote in 2009, another, another book, um, called After Abu Ghraib, um, Exploring Human Rights in America and the Middle East. Her name is um, Shadi Mokhtari. Some of you may have heard of her. And she posits a very provocative argument. And, and, it, and I feel like the book should also give rise to some debate. We should be provoked. And so let me, let me provoke you. Um, she says that, that while identifying with the victim is critical to creating and sustaining a human rights consciousness, the victims of Bush-era human rights abuses were nearly absent from the debate in the US. And in her critique of human rights activists, of whom I count myself among, she charges that the arguments and overarching frames employed by activists remain centered on the United States' identity and its interests. Meaning, I mean, she, she actually invokes John McCain's mantra, which always was, it's really about us. It's really about us as Americans that we shouldn't torture. It's really about um, the utilitarian arguments related to torture. It's really not about the legal prohibition or the moral abhorrence. And so the US should not engage in torture and, and enforce disappearance because uh, then our own service people would be vulnerable to these practices, right? You know, tit for tat. Um, we shouldn't, we, we, shouldn't, um, we shouldn't engage in torture because by employing abusive interrogation techniques, the US lowers itself to the likes of Al Qaeda. And then there's the most often vote argument, right? One we've heard time and time again, and I'm, I'm not sure that we can actually prove, and that is torture simply doesn't work. So why use it? So in the end, it was, it was these types of, of arguments that eclipsed or seemed to eclipse um, for me, and I think Maktari really has a point, eclipsed the argument that these behaviors were illegal under any circumstances, and they were immoral <coughs> in all circumstances. Now, it's really true that, and we all know, having done this work over the past decade, that it has been very, very difficult to humanize victims of rendition and secret detention because of the discourse I talked about before. It wasn't an easy task. But Mukhtari argues, and I, I have to say that I have some um, sympathy for this argument, that perhaps more forcefully pursuing the project to humanize the victims as individuals would have given the human rights community better long-term results. What we're suffering right now, right? We want better long-term results in terms of accountability, and we want to have public support for that accountability. Not only do we not have the accountability, 
we really don't have the public on our side either. Now many activists and lawyers would argue that they did attempt to give face and voice to victims. I know, we, you just named some of the victims um, that, that you and I and others have been working on behalf of. Many of you know the name of Maher Arar, who was the, Tunisian, or the Syrian Canadian citizen who was sent from the United States back to Syria where he was tortured. Um, he was released about 10 months later, came back to his home in Canada and gave a very compelling statement about what had happened to him in terms of his rendition, his torture in Syria despite numerous visits by Canadian consular officials, etc. But let's look at what happened to Maher in Canada versus what happened to Maher in the United States. Um, when you compare Maher's name recognition in the U.S with the fact that he appeared in a positive light as Newsmaker of the Year in the Canadian edition of Time magazine in 2004, you understand that he had status as a victim, first and foremost, in, in Canada. Time's Canadian bureau chief at the time, Stephen Frank, said this about Maher Arar. This was before the inquiry. This is before anybody knew much, right? He said, he has stepped into the spotlight, emerging as a vocal proponent of human rights in Canada, a symbol of how fear and injustice have permeated life in the West since 9-11. But the reality is that most victims of rendition in secret detention cannot step into the light the way that Maher did. Many are still in Guantanamo Bay and may remain there indefinitely. A number are in prisons abroad serving sentences after unfair trials in places like Egypt. A number have been so psychologically damaged by the, the actual abuse they suffered, which gave them the victim label, and the continuing psychological um, abuse that they suffer because they still have the taint of being a terrorist. I would argue that Khalid al-Masri is, is that kind of a person who has now really suffered tremendously, even though he has an actual <coughs> acknowledgement by two governments that he's an innocent victim of these practices. In terms of stepping into the light, in 2007, a group of six human rights organizations created a list of 38 ghost detainees, people who have, had disappeared. Some of them have resurfaced but dozens remain out of the light. We don't know where they are. It is true that a few victims of these practices have fought for accountability publicly. Most notably, a group of former Guantanamo Bay detainees in the UK, led by a group called Cage Prisoners, who's, uh, who's one of the heads of the organization. I'm sure you've heard his name, Moaz and Beg. But they do so with very little public support and with the label of terrorist always being invoked whenever they're in the newspaper or on the television. This is despite the fact that not one of them has ever been charged or tried in a fair trial or convicted of any criminal act whatsoever. But I, and I, and I believe that this task force believe as well that it's not too late and it's, it's worth the effort to reassert the proposition that victims of counterterrorism operations the world over have rights, whether they are innocent victims or indeed whether they are implicated. It's an ideal time now in this accountability phase um, of the so-called war on terror to reassert the rights of victims. And I really think that we tried to do that with the book. Um, and so I'm, I'm particularly I'm particularly proud of that in the book. <clears throat> and so just very briefly, what does the law require? It, it should be said that victims of rendition and secret detention have a right to truth. They have a right to justice, and they have a right to reparation. When it comes to the right to truth, it's very interesting to note that it's not just them who have the right to truth. Their families have a right to know the circumstances of their disappearance why they have residual effects related to torture and ill-treatment. But you and I also have a right to truth. We have a right to know what our government, 
whether you, it doesn't matter which government, if you're from the UK or Germany or Italy, or any of the governments that were colluded with the US on these practices, we have a right as the public to know what governments did in our name, particularly when they have done things to fundamentally abuse the most basic of rights. Second is justice. What Amrit's project is doing here in terms of seek, seeking litigation, strategic litigation opportunities. Um, is absolutely critical. We have nothing going on in the U.S., but there is a lot of interesting stuff going on in Europe, in, in a number of countries in Europe. And we need to really press forward on that. And the last thing is reparation. And I, I think it really needs to be said that reparation isn't just about monetary issues. And you will hear the victims of these practices say it often that they would trade the million dollars for an apology. And so what are the elements of, of reparation? They, it could be money, but it could be restitution, some attempt to put people back where they were before these things happened. Sweden tried to do this with two rendition victims. They actually, after the fact, after they'd been sent to Egypt and they'd been tortured and their cases were adjudicated at UN level, they repealed, they basically took back the expulsion orders. It was a symbolic thing, but it had a lot of meaning for both men, for their advocates, and for their families. It also means satisfaction. Satisfaction would be the apology, which very few, if any, rendition and secret detention victims have gotten. We had a couple of politicians in the U.S. apologize via video link to Maher Arar. But I think he's still waiting for the big dogs to say they're sorry. <coughs> and finally, the issue of non-repetition. And non-repetition is really what the end game is from all of this. And that means reforms put in place with respect to uh, evidentiary issues, with respect to you know, invoking state secrets, with respect to knowing that there is no rendition and secret detention going on full stop, so that there's a reformed system where these types of abuses can never happen again. So, thanks very much. <coughs> okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, the IBA. Um, uh, it's, it was an honor for me to be invited as a member, so I'm, I'm really grateful to Mark and in particular to Alex. Um, secondly, I want to thank really wholeheartedly the chair of the task force because it was uh, such a controversial subject and there were moments when without his leadership I think we would have gone astray. So thank you and it's from the depth of my heart that I really feel honored to be, uh, to be under your leadership. And of course my thanks to all my colleagues uh, who supported sometimes very uh, generously some of the controversial and heated arguments that we had, uh, but they are really pleasant memories that I will always retain. So thank you to everybody. Now the, the time that I have, I'll, um, I mean, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but uh, there are a few things which I want to say. And essentially, I want to look at three areas. I mean, my, my mandate is more specific than just broad international law. Uh, but um, while I'm looking at um, Pakistan and Afghanistan, international law will come into it, and there are really quite relevant issues that are happening. So um, briefly, what I want to do is, firstly, I want to look at some of the sensitive issues which we have um, elaborated in depth in the report. Obviously, I don't have the time to, to go into detail, but I can touch upon those. Secondly, um, I think it's important for us to retain a historical perspective to all the debate that we have uh, on any issue, particularly something like terrorism and counterterrorism. So I can, I'll just briefly allude to that. And thirdly, I want to update you on what has happened very recently um, once the report was in its final stages and it's now been published. But there are issues which are emerging which we, which were, we were quite concerned about when we were completing the final drafts. Um, I mean, more specifically, I want to consider the issue of legality um, uh, relating to drones, and it's already been mentioned, things like targeted killings, secret detentions, and domestic counterterrorism legislation, particularly in Pakistan. Um, now, one of the issues which is 
quite sensitive and it has been a very recent occurrence is, um, as you, some of you might know, last week, i.e. Uh, March 17th and 18th, um, a certain individual called Raymond Davis was released from uh, Pakistan. He had um, he was charged uh, for uh, having committed uh, murder in, in the country. And the day that he was released, I mean, it's very controversial. We don't have the time, but there are differing uh, opinions on it, whether he had diplomatic immunity or whether he was, in fact, um, a CIA operator or an agent. But that, despite that, his release, uh, the next day, uh, there was a drone attack which killed uh, some, uh, 40 people, including many civilians. So uh, there is a growing amount of resentment, and that's, uh, it was echoed, uh, I think, quite prominently by the state organs, uh, i.e. The, the army, which uh, uh, very strongly opposed that drone attack. And uh, so it, it, it is quite uh, revealing for us what is going on in that country in terms of the drone attacks. So le let me just give you a brief flavor of uh, the historical uh, perspective, which I said is important. Now, as, as you know, in, in, in Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, th these issues go back uh, quite a long way. Uh, I mean, the, these are, uh, these, both these countries are, uh, I mean, they have significance in geopolitical terms. And it's unfortunate that that, that region has faced a, a lot of double standards, particularly, dare I say, from the United States. Um, I mean, some of you would, would be aware of the, the post-1979 uh, issues which Pakistan faced. I mean, we had a military dictator at that time. And suddenly, uh, the, the sort of uh, villains were, were became, became uh, heroes overnight. Uh, I mean, General Zia was a military dictator. But because uh, the West needed him, I mean, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of support for what he did. And what he essentially did was he radicalized, uh, brought uh, religious extremism in the social fabric. So you would still hear of laws such as blasphemy laws. I mean, I don't have the time to go into that, but they're really extreme to, to the core. Similarly, you have Hadood laws, uh, which discriminate against women and, and minorities, religious minorities. We hear all, a, talk, a lot of talk about the madrissas, but that was the product of that time. Similarly, there was a lot of support for the Sunni radical organizations, Lashkar e Taiba, for example, which now are, are deemed terrorist. And, and most importantly, you, you know that uh, there was a lot of support for Taliban, who were uh, at that time Mujahideen, and uh, you know uh, Osama bin Laden was uh, was a close ally of Pakistan and, of course, the the West. Now, jumping straight on to to the position after 9/11. Again, we had a scenario where we, you had a military dictator in power, and he lashed on to the opportunity, and he became a, an ally of the United States and the West. And then you, you see a whole raft of arbitrary detentions, other uh, undemocratic uh, you know, functioning. I mean, colleagues have already mentioned disappearances, detentions, arbitrariness, and abuse in, in domestic counterterrorism legislation, support for targeted killings, drones and extrajudicial killings that, that went on were, were, were under the, the garb of what we have the, you know, in terms of a military dictator claiming that these are extraordinary times, so we have to rely on the war on terror. So th that is the sort of brief historical perspective that I wanted to give you. I mean, as I said, there's a, there's a lot more to it, but uh, uh, I mean, we don't have the time really to go into this at, the, at that point. But what I want to focus now is the issue of legality in terms of the drone attacks and targeted killings. Now, what we have is there are a number of legal justifications that are produced in, in terms of drone attacks and, 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 and the killings that are going on, particularly in, in the northwestern frontier of Pakistan. One um, issue that is quite significant for us to realize is that under human rights law, it can never be justified to have premeditated intentional killing. So, for example, shoot to kill policy is always unlawful. It is a different matter when it's a, it's a self-defense issue, when you cannot, when you don't have the opportunity to, to, to think and to react appropriately. But under international human rights law, 
that is never permissible. And I, I'm glad to say that our report has exemplified that in, in quite some detail. The other issue, which is quite interesting and quite complicated, is the position of targeted killings and you know, drone attacks under international humanitarian law. Now, this is, this is interesting because, as, as was mentioned earlier, what is the position in armed conflict? Now, there are lots of rigid normative criterion. For example, uh, the issue of combatants, that they have to be combatants. But if you look at some of the instances, I mean, even the most striking case of, for example, the killing of Batullah Masood, who was a, supposedly an alleged uh, Al-Qaeda leader. Well, you, you can argue, you can justify that. But there were 12 people who got killed alongside him. He was allegedly, he was receiving treatment. So he was actually not an active co combatant at the time of his death. So that raises issues in, in international humanitarian law in any event. But then his wife got killed. Uh, his uh, his parents-in-law got killed. There was a medic that got killed at that time. So, you know, there is a question of uh, accountability when you have these drone attacks. And the point that I want to make is if these armed um, if there is this, an armed conflict that's going on in Pakistan, then what is the liability of the operators of these drones? So, for example, someone sitting in the United States just presses a button and, and the drone goes and kills someone in Pakistan. Now, are these combatants? I mean, what, you know, what are the sort of rules of engagement? So these are really complex uh, legal issues, but they have political dimension as well. The final point on, the, on this I want to make is about the legitimacy of uh, the debate on self-defense. Again, we, we don't have the time, but there are really rigid issues about whether it's a, there's an armed attack in Pakistan, whether there's anticipatory self-defense, whether the action is proportional. It, should, it must be proportional, but these raise serious uh, points of concern. In terms of the political cost, this is a huge issue. And I, I, I'm really uh, disappointed to, to mention to you that under Obama administration, these drone attacks have actually increased uh, more significantly than it, it was the case in, under the previous uh, administration. So the whole point about uh, winning hearts and minds argument, I think it's, it's, it's really lost. Because if you talk to people in Afghanistan and Pakistan, you know, you've, you've lost the case there. And there, there is a huge amount of disproportionate killings that are going on. Uh, drones are not humans. Drones don't have emotions. People have emotions, and they can see, and they can, they can feel the, the, the issue. Now, finally, um, I, I will just turn to one further issue on, of legality that relates to the existing legislation in Pakistan and the difficulties that we have in terms of counterterrorism legislation. I mean, there, there are a number of laws, uh, primarily the anti-terrorism legislation, which we have discussed in, in our report, the 1997 uh, Act. There have been a series of amendments. But the problem that we faced is, firstly, the definition. Again, we, we have discussed that, and I must give credit to the report that we, without really going into too much of controversy, that the report has given a very good version of, of terrorism and how we define it. But in countries like Pakistan, you have an, a big issue. How do you define a terrorist? So for example, within the ambit of definition, we have sectarianism coming into it, you know, Sunni-Shia conflict. And these, these guys are tried by anti-terrorist courts, not by ordinary civilian courts. Then also, I mean, things like blasphemy. There's a big issue, you know. You try people in anti-terrorist courts, you know, for having uh, contributed blasphemy laws. So this is a real point of concern. Now, under, under the administration of General Musharraf, the problem was that uh, these uh, uh, counterterrorism laws were further amended, and the executive, i.e. the military, was given the, the mandate to actually decide on these, uh, sit on these courts and make judgments. And they, they were actually targeting political opponents, uh, i.e. their own opponents, as well as those who opposed the war on terror. So this has created widespread irregularities. Uh, I mean, we have mentioned detentions, there are torture, there's a huge amount of abuse of suspects. And unfortunately, uh, the problem goes on because the current uh, civilian administration is actually following the same mandate, and it has not reformed uh, the counterterrorism legislation. So I'll, I'll hand, end here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to the three members of the panel. The, the discussion is now open for, for questions or comments. We'll start with the audience here, and then we'll find out uh, whether there are any questions uh, come, uh, coming over as a result of the webcast. Who wants to? Ren? Um, 
this is, I guess, for Juan, but then anybody else. What do you do when international law runs up against national democratic practice and, for that matter, national judiciary uh, rule of law? Specifically, for example, in the United States at this point, it used to, it used to be that you conceived that the president, Bush, Nixon, and so forth, would do things the, the, and you'd have a terrible time trying to convince the legislature to tell them to stop doing them. But in, now we have a situation where giving Obama the benefit of the doubt, he's trying to do things, but the Congress specifically forbids him to do it. A very conservative judiciary gets in his way. I mean, for example, just to give the example of if Obama wants to move Guantanamo to a stateside prison and Congress votes democratically, no, you can't do that, denies him funds, uh, in Europe, when this sort of thing happens, you can always appeal to the European Court of Human Rights or something, but what kind of a, as, as a believer in the rule of law, how do you, how do you deal with a situation like that? Should, should I take it? <clears throat> well, you know, uh, under international law, uh, the state is responsible anyway, and it doesn't matter whether the judiciary is the violator or the legislative branch or the executive branch. and the. Uh, the state also cannot invoke its domestic legislation to avoid obligations under international law. That's all, you know, well said and done, uh, but it does uh, leave us with the, uh, the, the declaratory nature of the violation of, the, of international law. And uh, you, you obviously uh, said something important. The United States uh, is, uh, does not submit itself to any kind of international adjudication, uh, except uh, before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights that, as you know, valiantly tries to uh, do its work, uh, beginning with uh, interim measures on, or pre precautionary measures on Guantanamo in, already in 2002, uh, but also very recently issuing a, a very, very strong report and fortunately a report that was well received in the U.S. press on immigration detention in the United States. So um, I think you know you should ask somebody like Anthony Romero, why go to the Inter-American Commission when you don't have uh, any kind of enforcement mechanism? And uh, Anthony would say, well, at the very least, you know, we get the victims to have a day in court, to have uh, to, to to be heard, to be uh, to to have the opportunity and. Uh, we highlight the incongruity of the United States presenting itself as a, uh, as a defender of uh, an international order based in law, but not willing to be, you know, beholden to its own international law obligations. Can a Pakistani in Guantanamo go to the Inter-American Court? For, for yeah, the, not the Inter-American Court, the Inter-American Commission, because uh, for the Inter-American Court, the U.S. has not signed or ratified the American Convention, but because it is a member of the OAS, the Organization of American States, the Inter-American Commission does have jurisdiction to hear cases, and it doesn't matter who, the, the nationality of the victim doesn't matter. Can I just add to that? Can I just add that accountability in a number of European um, countries is, is something that is, that is ongoing right now. I mean, in at least four or five different countries. I mean, CIA agents have actually been prosecuted and convicted in Italy for an abduction that was related to a rendition to torture. And I think it's those opportunities as well that give victims some sense that someone somewhere will be held accountable. I think you're right when you say that you have to bracket the US, but I, I don't think we focused enough attention on accountability in other places, in Spain, in Italy, in um, Lithuania, in Poland, in Romania, the latter being places where secret detention centers were located. And I think we really, that is really the game right now, is to continue to push on the European front. Because if, if, if the interest really is for us to be victim-centered, it's in those fora right now where we see the most hope for any kind of accountability. Uh, my question is for so, actually, could you, I don't think people can hear. really loudly. Um, regarding Arar, I, I found your comments thought-provoking. 
Thank you. I did indeed find your comments thought-provoking, but and I'd like to hear a little bit more because I think that Arar is a somewhat unique case. I say this as a dual U.S. and Canadian national, and I think that some of the a major reason why Arar was such a prominent case in Canada is because it it allowed the Canadian public to criticize the U.S., which is a major feature of sort of Canadian identity, particularly post 9-11. <laughs> There's a rhetoric around the big bad United States that does these terrible things. So even though the Canadian government took responsibility and acknowledged its own role, I think the overarching theme was still an opportunity to criticize the U.S. and its role in the war on terror. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about what we can do inside the U.S. in terms of changing this dialogue, because as you said, so many of us have spent a lot of years talking about the victims, and we stopped because it wasn't working. People would say, when you talk about these victims, instead we just see terrorists, and the American public just sees another terrorist. So stop putting their pictures in the papers, stop telling their stories, and talk about these other more instrumental arguments that I agree with you are somewhat problematic. There were several commentators who had a similar um, re reaction to the Mukhtari article. It was, you know, it's been really difficult. We've tried our best, so we had to have these alternatives. First on, on, on RR, I mean, what's fascinating about that is Canada's been, like, the U.S. is, like, I, I shouldn't say, like, uh, has been the U.S.'s, one of the U.S.'s most willing partners in terms of the global war on terrorism. So you may say that this is an opportunity for, for Canada to um, thumb its nose at the U.S. in terms of its counterterrorism policies and practices, but I think it's, I think it's more layered than that. Uh, I think Maher's case was so extreme, and he was uh, willing to come forward in a very honest and forthright way. And in a way that many other victims haven't been able to, and so I'm not I'm not totally convinced that it was it was just this one-dimensional um, kind of blowback to the U.S. Uh, you know I don't know the answer to your second. That I just don't know what it is. I just came from Europe where the same problems obtain. Uh, trying to figure out how to humanize victims of counterterrorism policies, how civil society can actually fight the discourse of terrorism and national security threat. And I, I think that others may be, I, I am really at a loss. Uh, and I, and I, wish I, I wish my brain were bigger. Um, but One? Um, I just uh, shared a panel uh, last week with uh, Maher Arar in San Francisco. But he had to talk via Skype because uh, he's in a no-fly list. And one, one thing we can do is, demand that if he hasn't been charged with anything, he has been declared innocent, he has been the victim of such an incredible abuse, at the very least the United States should not prevent him from visiting the United States. Uh, and uh, there was also a campaign by Amnesty International to, uh, to seek apologies for him, uh, which I think is a very well uh, taken point by, by Julia in her uh, uh, earlier remarks. I think uh, the problem that we have uh, with the war on terror is that the, we don't have the public with us, and we don't have the public with us because the public uh, doesn't want to know who the victims are. They, they, the torture is okay as long as it happens to people whose faces we don't see and whose names we can't pronounce and we don't even want to, to, to pronounce them. And that is, you know, compared to the many campaigns that we've had against torture in many parts of the world, that is a big handicap because we have lost a lot of ground in terms of the condemnation by society itself of the practice of torture. Um, it's slightly, slightly off the topic, but I'd like to take the opportunity of asking the panel. The uh, United States is essentially in a war situation by going to Libya, and that's the ultimate in trying to, to, to do human rights. And what's very scary now is the news is coming out that maybe we're out there and we may be protecting people that are supporters of Al Qaeda. And so I'd like you to comment because we're all about human rights and we get all this information from the press and now we're sending planes and it's caused a huge furor in this country as to whether Congress should have been consulted. I really would like the opinion of this panel who are so focused on human rights. 
Mr. Bird, you want to? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this is not easy. This is not easy. But um, I, I think what, what I would say is that um, Libya is, is a complicated uh, case. I mean, in terms of international law, if, if you look at the mandate which the Security Council has, historically, is only been when there is a, there's a threat of aggression or threat to international peace and security. But the, it, the, the current case forms an exception because it is about purely a domestic situation where there was serious risk of uh, a regime abusing its own people. And the, the Security Council took an, an unprecedented, or I think there are some precedents, but this was quite, a, quite, a, quite one of those, where it decided to take action against uh, a brutal regime. Now, I, I think personally that if uh, the United States and its Western allies, although I've, you know, you've seen my criticism previously, but if they hadn't taken any action, we'd be sitting here and criticizing the West for actually ignoring a brutal regime, killing its people systematically, as unfortunately happened in the case of, for example, former Yugoslavia for, for a very long time. So I think it's, uh, now we have to see what, I mean, I think they, the Security Council was right, and uh, the United States was right to take action. But the question is, how do you operate it? it, it, it is a, it's a problematic issue. I mean, they've set up a no-fly zone. They attempted to, to secure a no-fly zone. But there are issues in terms of operation. I think they've got to look at what is the long-term future. I mean, U, U, US or any other country cannot be engaged in a conflict for a very long time. I think they would have to negotiate. And obviously, regime ch change is not uh, a mandate that the Security Council or international law at the moment provides. So it, it is not easy. But I, I, I mean, personally, I, I would not, uh, I don't feel terrified in, the, in terms of the UN taking some concrete actions to protect people who would otherwise uh, be facing genocide. And that, that was the situation on the ground. I don't know if I have. I also think that the Security Council was wise in referring the case to the, inter uh, to the International Criminal Court because now uh, the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over every action there. And so if the international forces violate the laws of war, they'll be subject to the uh, ICC jurisdiction. And so we have, a, we have a monitor. That's not right? I'm sorry. There is an exception. Oh. Only Libyan nationals, no foreign nationals. Okay, sorry. Stand correct. The US, that was the condition. Well, but at least we'll be looking. We'll be looking. Well, Thank I, you. But I would just add, I think, I think it's important to recognize this is, this is the, really the first mm. use of the responsibility mm. to protect, mm. which was very much a soft law. There, the, 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 there was no international law uh, behind giving, mm. giving any force to this idea of responsibility to, to, to protect innocent civilians, a responsibility that is in the first place on governments, and when governments fail, then the international community is entitled to take action, and that's what the Security Council has done for the very first time. So this is a very new, uh, this is a very new development, mm. and, and it's certainly by my now, it's a very exciting one. Um, I just wanted to go back to the parts of the book. I just wondered what the goal of the book was and how you think how it could be used to address this issue of public accountability that you were talking about earlier um, to build more support. What the goals of the report were. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you under, it's more, it's a pretty general question and maybe towards one from Amnesty. I don't know. Well, I mean, the book, the the book is actually, you know, we, we struggled with, do we want a very turgid legal analytical text? Do we want something that was more accessible? I think we've got, we, we've struck a nice balance. I think the book can be used as, in some instances, as a real primer. You know, what, it, what, what are the requirements of IHL when it comes to these phenomena, uh, et cetera? But then it goes into a lot of the case law, and I think that's what distinguishes it the, it goes into a lot of the, the current developments in case law and then makes the argument for accountability and victims' rights, et cetera. We kind of take it to the end game, right? And so I actually think the book can be used, um, I think it can be used for training. I think it can be used in law classes on uh, rule of law and counterterrorism. There's a number of ways that it can be used. It is fundamentally a very accessible text. The notes, 
are, are quite extensive, but the text itself, I think, is, is really been written in a way to give broad access, as I said in my, my presentation, to a number of, of different types of actors. Okay, are, are there any questions from, because yeah, we, we're running out of time. Sorry, so this is a question from um, our web audience. Do you believe there is any real possibility of an indictment against members of the Bush administration, for example, lawyers or CIA agents, and if so, um, where or under what jurisdiction? I feel like I'm talking a lot. Um, we can only hope. Uh, what, you will note that there are various interesting things that have happened. So President, former President Bush was supposed to visit Geneva a few weeks ago. And uh, human rights cross, uh, groups across the world, really, um, joined forces and submitted documentation, um, memoranda, evidence, etc., to prosecutors in Switzerland. Uh, some, there were different strategies, but in any event, it became quite an issue, and, and he canceled the trip. Now, obviously, the goal there, um, after um, former President Bush issued his memoir, where he acknowledged that he authorized torture in the form of waterboarding, uh, the goal there was for him to go and to get arrested. Uh, and that didn't happen, but it's for, symbolically it was very, very important to press the issue. Um, there is a case in Spain right now against six um, actors in the former Bush administration, basically for, for, for drafting the memos. Uh, so it's basically issues of command responsibility that has, is still live in Spain. Um, we have had some uh, unfortunate defeats in Europe. Uh, a German case that was intended to force the government to transmit arrest warrants for 13 CIA agents who'd been implicated in renditions uh, <coughs> failed, unfortunately, in the German courts just this past year. Um, the 22 CIA agents and one military officer who were convicted for an abduction related to the, um, a rendition in Italy, that case is now on, a, on a, 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 the highest appeal in, in Italy. Um, and so whether it happens in the U.S. or not, I think I would leave it to the lawyers who practice in the U.S., but certainly in Europe, there's still, there's still, uh, there, it's still, the issue's still live. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, so I want to thank everybody for coming to, to be with us, to the, to the audience on the web, and particularly to, to OSI, Amrit, thank you, and to, to the RBA, Mark, for, for, for having conceived of the, uh, of the book. We hope that, that people will read it, and we hope that they will learn from it, and we even hope that they might enjoy reading it. And thank you very much to the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>